life little by little went back to normal over the course of 1919 and 1920, such, such that by the end of 1920, people wanted <laughs> a return to normalcy. And that, not surprisingly, was the campaign slogan of the winning candidate, Warren Harding, in the U.S. presidential election of 1920. So we have to ask then, what, what was the impact? Did things actually change? beyond those individual lives lost that were so widely and randomly distributed all throughout the global population, did things change? Did institutions change government, thought, philosophy, behavior? Well, one thing we can say up front that several authors have pointed out is that on this sort of high institutional level, things largely didn't change institutions bounced right back once the number of available healthy working men and women returned to its previous baseline. The machinery just continued to run. But there were deeper changes and impacts that we can see that can be unearthed in the historical record. For one thing, we do, I think, have to say that the Spanish flu was partly responsible for the end of the First World War and for its outcome. That German aggressive offensive that managed to press into France and come within striking distance of Paris was halted largely by the spring outbreak of flu. And further, in the autumn, when the second more harmful wave of flu broke out, it surely contributed to Germany's inability to continue fighting. And we don't know exactly what was happening at this time to some of the high government officials in Germany, but there's a good chance it seems that Kaiser Wilhelm himself had a bout with Spanish flu. What really ended the war was Kaiser Wilhelm giving up and abdicating. There also was a wave of revolutions and strikes across much of the world as the war was ending in the autumn and winter of 1918 to 1919. And it's common to attribute this wave of revolutions, strikes, and government collapses to the war. But when you think about it, the Spanish flu had killed more people it had weakened the organs of power in many places, and it had caused a certain degree of disillusionment and dissatisfaction with governments that in many cases didn't even own up to and acknowledge the fact that the flu was such a large disaster. And so it was certainly a contributing factor to some of these political cataclysms, such as the communist revolution in Germany that briefly took over large parts of Germany at the end of the war, and the independence uprising in Korea against the Japanese forces occupying Korea, as well as other waves of strikes and revolts in many countries around the world. Now, ironically, with so many people cleansed out of the population by the pandemic, people who had had respiratory problems, immune problems that made them vulnerable to the Spanish flu, the population that then was left behind was actually unusually healthy and robust. You now had a sort of smaller core of very healthy people who had survived the pandemic and who often then married and had lots of children and lived very long lives. And so demographically, the population bounced back quite quickly. And there was even a sort of long baby boom in the 1920s. And this is part of why we don't see an obvious lingering devastation. It's in this, in this way, the disaster sort of paved the way for a quick demographic recovery. But that being said, there also were many people born with defects as a result of the Spanish flu. The people who, who were born in 1919, 1920, often were survivors of complicated pregnancies where their mothers had been afflicted with the flu. 
And so there was a sort of small micro generation, you could say, with a very high rate of heart disease and with problems like impulse control. They were less likely to go to school and finish school. They were more likely to be involved in crime, end up in prison. So you could say there was this kind of small cadre that had the lingering negative effects, even as then the rest of the population really became exceptionally healthy and robust. Out of those who were infected, who were already born by 1918 and were infected but survived, I mentioned some of those very famous people who survived the illness. And some of them, in some cases, exemplify the lingering health effects that could actually persist and become chronic through life from people who had the disease. Many had chronic sinus and ear infections, chronic pain, and a very large number of people, it seems, in the 1920s and 30s had severe chronic fatigue, sleepiness, depression, irritability. And it's debated by historians how much that might have been the result of Spanish flu, but it certainly seems possible. And as I said, there are cases of famous people whose names we might know, such as Amelia Earhart, who had chronic symptoms like Earhart had recurring sinusitis that was a big problem for her in her aviation career. And Bella Bartok, the music composer, had chronic ear infections, which almost caused him to go deaf. There was also just the very widespread and lingering trauma from social and personal relationships disrupted by illness and death. There was a great deal of lingering grief, most of it untreated. There was not much psychotherapy going on to speak of in the 1920s and 30s. There was very common survivor's guilt including among widows and widowers and orphans. Remember, the Spanish flu particularly hit people in their 20s and 30s. So that meant a lot of people whose spouses were lost to them right in the prime of life. And it meant a great deal of young children who lost their parents and maybe were taken up by family or adopted or put into orphanages, foster care, thrown into the care of the state. And orphans in this situation often also had all kinds of lingering effects of depression, delinquency, crime. There was also just alongside the grief and the lost relationships, there was a sense of lost possibilities, of possible lives that could have been lived and were not. Again, especially because so many were struck down right in the prime of life. That's part of why Egon Schiele's painting, The Family, is so associated with the Spanish flu, because it was an attempt to capture a life that he might have lived and did not. In some cases where the Spanish flu hit especially hard, entire generations were practically wiped out, which could lead to the collapse of entire small societies tribal societies can really be basically wiped out if there isn't effective transmission of knowledge and traditions from one generation to another. And there are instances of this, for example, among Inuit tribes in Alaska that had never experienced influenza before and then were just absolutely mowed down when Spanish flu reached them. Another example is in the island nation of Vanuatu in the Pacific, which is a very complex and diverse society with many small tribes and nations speaking different languages. And it's estimated that the devastation there led to 20 languages going extinct for lack of that crucial generation to pass them on. And many people know and maybe are familiar with the sort of common mood of detachment and cynicism in the 1920s and early 1930s. 30s, which you can see in the art, the literature, the philosophy, the sense of loss of confidence in traditional institutions, a sort of layer of, of nihilism or cynicism. And some people who illustrate that, such as Dashiell Hammett, you know, the master of hard-boiled mystery and crime fiction that provided the fodder for film noir. He was a survivor of Spanish flu. Edvard Munch was a survivor. 
T.S. Eliot was a survivor, and he actually began writing The Wasteland while he was convalescing and recovering from Spanish flu. And in The Wasteland, you can see there are sort of notes of optimism, you know, which he, he clung to in the later parts of The Wasteland. But a lot of that long poem is just sort of cataloging scenes of desolation, eerie vignettes of people lost, people grieving, people withdrawn. So in that way, it sort of colors, you might argue, it could, it could be seen to color a lot of the art and literature and thought of those decades, even though it's almost never explicitly referred to. There are instances I'll talk about later, but T.S. Eliot never explicitly made mention <laughs> of the Spanish flu or the fact that he had it. There also was a great blow of confidence in mainstream medicine, of academically trained medicine. So authors like Alfred Crosby, the sort of great historian of disease and epidemics, as he pointed out, you were just as well off seeking help from a sort of traveling folk healer witch doctor in your village as you were going to a university trained physician during the Spanish flu pandemic. You know, you could kind of pick your poison, basically. But even still, the confidence that the literate upper and middle classes did have in medical knowledge and medical training at that time was really shaken by the sense of futility in the face of the Spanish flu. And so in the 1920s, there was a great rise in interest in alternative medicine and alternative theories of health and the body, even among classes of people who weren't going to go to that sort of folk healer grandmother in the village. There was a great rise of interest in chiropractics and in homeopathy. This is the time, the 1920s, when homeopathy really took off. There was also a new promotion and insistence on sports and outdoor activity, even as an alternative to medicine. You know, this may have not been such a bad idea. Sports and outdoor activities can be very good for your health, but they do not, as some people at the time seem to have thought, confer immunity to infectious diseases. <laughs> An interesting instance of this is King Alfonso of Spain, who actually was a survivor of the Spanish flu and was one of the reasons why people in other countries associated the disease with Spain. He devoted himself to this theory of physical activity and outdoor activity as a prophylactic against disease. And he became the sponsor and patron of a new football club in the capital city, which came to be called Real Madrid. It was, you could say, it was a legacy of the Spanish flu. There also was a wave of interest and experimentation in sort of ways of returning to nature, getting away from the supposedly toxic environment of civilization back to nature. There was a great movement to nudism and vegetarianism. And again, vegetarianism is a perfectly healthy thing to do. Probably for most people, it's more healthy than not, but it's not going to prevent you from getting influenza per se. There also was a rise in smoking. There was a widespread notion that popped up in 1919 that smoking could help prevent the infection. It's possible that might have been true. I am not a scientist. I have no opinion on this. Do not listen to anything I say about it. But it's not entirely clear whether that was true or false. If you were worried about a respiratory disease that could be passed by air, it's possible that smoking or maybe nicotine might have helped a little bit. But it's still, of course, overall, a very bad thing to do for your health. And it saw an upsurge in the 1920s, particularly to women. And it was considered sort of unladylike for women to smoke before the First World War. But it really made the leap to the female gender in the 1920s. And perhaps not surprisingly, there also were religious responses. There was a great growth in the Christian Science Church, which teaches that most health problems can be solved by prayer rather than by medical treatment. 
There was a rise in faith healers and new movements around faith healers and also prophets who interpreted disease as some kind of sign of a coming change in dispensation or a divine judgment. And these popped up in many places around the world. As for the medical and scientific response, their authority had really been challenged and called into question, of course, by this disaster. And so not surprisingly, it spurred on much more intense study of viruses. The word virus had previously just been understood to mean some kind of very fine poisonous substance that could pass through materials like ceramic vessels that bacteria could not. So it was somehow either smaller or finer than bacteria, but past that, there was really no understanding of what they were or how they worked. And viruses continued to be totally invisible to the human eye all through the 1920s, but increasingly scientists in laboratories deduced that they must exist and that they must be some kind of tiny organism, kind of like bacteria, but smaller and that operate in some kind of different way. And so the field of virology gradually established itself and began producing more vaccines by the 1930s. They were able to isolate the routes by which these putative viruses were able to move from one body to another, from one organism to another, and how they would trigger different responses and symptoms and hence they were able to find what sort of substances, you know, whether mucus or pus, could be used to create vaccines, and the effectiveness rose tremendously. It also spurred on the growth in the field of epidemiology and the notion that uh, infectious diseases operate differently, they pass from one host to another in different ways, and that they interact with larger social systems. And hence, the older notion, the very Victorian notion, that infectious disease was primarily a sign of bad character and that you could blame groups of people, such as immigrants or the working poor, for the diseases they suffered because they were just too lazy or they, were, they did not practice cleanliness. This notion was gradually supplanted by a new sort of epidemiology which argued that diseases pass in very specific but difficult to discern ways and that it's largely social conditions, housing, sources of food, sources of water that allow diseases to spread. And hence, if you have, say, a crowded immigrant neighborhood with a high rate of tuberculosis, what people need is not to be lectured about working harder, but rather they need sunlight and air circulation. So there was a, a vast leap forward in epidemiology and a new stock in the importance of public health as the study and maintenance and prevention of disease through mass public policy. It happens that the U.S. Surgeon General Blue actually proposed in the 1920s the creation of a department of health. In several countries, political leaders began to put forward the idea of creating a national government-supported health system, either paid through a national uh, health insurance or simply paid for through the government budget. But most of these ideas and proposals went nowhere, at least for several decades. The, the notion of a Department of Health fell flat with Congress, and the research money into epidemiology and improved public health did not come from the government, which basically lost interest in the subject in the 20s and 30s, but rather it came largely from the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. MetLife had been devastated by the Spanish flu. They had to pay out enormous millions upon millions of payouts to all of these bereaved families who had lost people to this enormous, fast-moving, fast-acting pandemic. You know, this was exactly the sort of rare disaster that insurance companies hoped and prayed wouldn't happen. And so after Spanish flu, these insurance houses, especially MetLife, poured money into finding ways to prevent similar outbreaks from happening in future so that they wouldn't be then caught holding the bag. 
And these ideas of having a public health department, public health care agencies, public health insurance to manage health and medical care on a mass scale, they only gained traction very slowly. And even in the countries where they eventually were carried out, it mostly only happened after the Second World War and further disasters. For example, the creation of the National Health Service in Great Britain in 1947. And another reason why this sort of rise in public health took so long and really only took hold after the Second World War is the fact that medicine was still not very good in the 1920s and 30s. They still didn't have penicillin. They still didn't have antiviral drugs. There are all kinds of treatments that we think of as so basic that were still unknown. And it was only after healthcare and medicine had made these significant leaps forward in the 1930s and 40s that there then became a large public appetite for healthcare and medicine, where people wanted to have a hospital and a clinic that they knew they could go to, and they wanted to have ambulances to take them there. And so as the actual healthcare improved, the political will was mustered. So these are all, you could say, effects and impacts of the Spanish flu that people were more or less aware of. There were still, though, unanswered questions, things that people didn't know, and didn't necessarily even expect to know at the time when the pandemic hit. But all these decades later, now that we look back after a century, people really want answers to some of these mysteries. And there are now professional epidemiologists whose job it is to try to solve some of these strange questions. One of the big ones is where did it start? What conjuncture of events led this disease to first appear in humans and then break out? Well, as I said before, the first definite instance of influenza rapidly breaking out and causing severe symptoms that is clearly recorded and that is widely accepted to be part of the Spanish flu pandemic was that outbreak at Camp Funston in Kansas on March 4th. So the obvious assumption that many people made for many years was that that's where it started. Something happened in Kansas on or shortly before March 4th, 1918, that first set this pandemic into motion. But some people have questioned that and said there must be, we must be able to trace this back to a patient zero. We need to know who the first person infected was in order to figure out how this virus first came about, and more specifically, how it probably jumped from some other animal species to human beings. So if we look aside from Camp Funston, the first part of the world that people pointed to in the pandemic itself for blame was China. And a lot of that was probably due to racism and xenophobia, but it may have actually been incidentally correct. And there are some biologists today who do think that China was the origin point of the Spanish flu. In 1910, there was a large outbreak of pneumonic plague, or at least what people believed to be pneumonic plague, in far northern China and Manchuria. And doctors in China reported that patients in this outbreak had fluid and blood in the lungs and showed patches of purplish color on their skin. This pneumonic plague died out, it seems, by the end of 1910, probably because it was so lethal that hosts simply died and healthy people knew to stay away from the dead bodies and it stopped spreading. Several years later, though, in 1917, there was another outbreak in China, which was understood to be influenza. And that influenza broke out in a remote rural region of China called Shanxi. And it was weirdly similar to plague in, number, in a number of ways, although it was not as lethal and did not kill as many people. It had strange similarities. So it seems quite similar to what we think of as Spanish flu. The strange open question then is, if that is the origin of Spanish flu, it was this 
outbreak in Shanxi, China in 1917, how did it then somehow get to Kansas and then go from Kansas to Europe? This seems strange, but it happens that in 1918, China formally joined the Allied cause in the First World War. They had held back and remained neutral due to their own problems and issues, but they did formally throw their support behind the Allies. They did not send troops to the war front in Europe, but they did send laborers, a so-called Chinese labor corps, which would do things like build trenches and fortifications, repair vehicles, and so on, and in that way lend skilled and unskilled labor to the war cause. It, of course, was difficult to get these people to the war front. You could try to ship them somehow over land across Asia, but then you would run into the enemy forces in Germany and Austria. So many of these Chinese workers were actually sent on ships across the Pacific and landed in British Columbia on the Pacific coast of Canada. And they were then sent by train across Canada and sometimes the United States to the Atlantic coast, where they then were put on ships across the Atlantic to Europe. So it was a very long, difficult journey. And these trains across Canada were sealed. But if we suppose that there were some people on these trains who may have been carrying that influenza virus from China, and maybe also carrying some sort of bacillus bacteria from leftover from the 1910 plague outbreak, it's possible that any small contact, you know, a brief bathroom or cigarette break at a train station, a handshake through a window, could have passed this highly contagious virus to someone in Canada or the U.S. It could have been passed to someone in the military guards and transport teams who then ended up going to other fortresses, army camps, elsewhere in the U.S. or Canada, and then triggered this wave of outbreaks that moved from the interior of North America to the East Coast. And it's possible that this outbreak that we see in Camp Funston, Kansas, on March 4th was simply the earliest such outbreak that happened to be recorded and that has been found. But possibly by that time, the disease had already been spreading. So that is one theory that maybe the origin point was China and from there it infected North America and then Europe. However, there are others who argue that there is an even earlier outbreak that was happening by the end of 1916 in Europe, and that that is the more likely origin. So in the winter of 1916 to 17, there was an outbreak of flu at the French army camp and hospital at Etaples, which was a number of miles away from the war front. And... Apparently, according to the surviving descriptions, this outbreak of flu was accompanied by bronchitis or lung irritation and sometimes by purplish discoloration in the face. So again, it's remarkably reminiscent of what we later hear in the autumn of 1918, almost two years later. Strangely, this outbreak of severe flu and bronchitis seems to have stayed within a few military bases near Etaple, and it does not seem to have spread much to civilians as far as we can tell, but that might be partly because when civilians did get sick or die, their deaths were recorded in the documentation simply as pneumonia and not as a new form of flu. Why didn't, if the pathogen existed at Etaple as early as December 1916, why did it not break out dramatically then? Why did it wait for so long before becoming a massive pandemic? Maybe that was because of limited and contained travel, that very few people were going anywhere from Etaple other than maybe one other nearby military base and the encampments on the front. They were not going around taking motoring vacations, visiting family, going to the theater. And so whatever this pathogen was at this time, it was contained in these small, limited populations. 
Another possibility is that there were still mutations happening, that maybe the virus at this point was not yet as super contagious as it would become later, and that it had to sort of linger and be passed around for some period of time before some fatal mutation happened that made it go global. So that's another theory, the idea that it, it began at this base at Etaple in France. A third theory is that it actually began in Kansas, not at Fort Funston, but in a very sparsely populated rural area farther east in Kansas, in Haskell County, which was, as I said, very rural with scattered farms and especially a lot of hog farms. And it seems that there was an outbreak of flu in Haskell County, accompanied very often by pneumonia in January 1918. And the local doctor saw that this flu outbreak, which was not such a surprising thing for January, was more virulent than he was accustomed to seeing and led more often to pneumonia and led to three deaths, which for a population of that size was surprising. And he reported this fact to the U.S. Public Health Service in Washington. So it's considered possible that this might actually be the origin point of the Spanish flu, partly because it seems overwhelmingly likely that the, the real beginning of this strain of influenza must have been in the animal kingdom outside the human species, and that pigs seem like a very likely vector that could have picked up this virus from some other animals, allowed it to morph and mutate into a slightly different form that could infect pig lungs, and then from there pass from pig lungs to fairly similar human lungs. Pig lungs and human lungs are so similar that in fact sometimes humans can even get lung transplants from pigs. So pigs seem like a very likely gateway for the virus to have gotten from the animal world to humans. The French military base at Etaple had its own pigsty, and Haskell County, Kansas, has a population of pigs on the pig farms. However, one arguable weakness of this theory is that there probably have been many sort of unusually severe flu outbreaks in towns and rural counties all over America every year. And it just happens that this doctor was especially vigilant and wanted to record this information and get it to Washington, where uh, others wouldn't have. But nonetheless, it is certainly conceivable that some farmhand son of a farmer in Haskell County was recruited and went to enlist in the army at Camp Funston and unwittingly brought this unusually virulent flu virus into the camp. Now, a fourth theory that's sort of most vague and sketchy of all is that it wasn't any of these places. It was just somewhere else that has not yet been located. And the reason why some people theorize this is that you can also see unusual instances of severe flu outbreaks happening already by no later than February 1918, in other words, weeks before the Camp Funston outbreak. So there is some uncertain and sketchy evidence that some people in New York City were already falling sick from a new form of flu in February 1918. Now, this might arguably dovetail with the China theory, which holds that it began by 1917 in China and then spread to North America, it also could possibly dovetail with the France theory that maybe some American soldiers or sailors had picked it up in Europe and then were bringing it back to New York City in America by February 1918. The only other theory that this would invalidate would be the Kansas one. People were getting it in New York by February, then the outbreak in Kansas in March is just is just a minor incident in an epidemic that was already starting. So any of these theories could possibly be true. It could maybe be some sort of combination of more than one, or they could all be wrong. There might be some further case 
that just has not been unearthed yet and connected to the bigger picture. It could be that there was some other earlier patient zero that we'll never find, who simply was never recorded in writing, somewhere in remote rural China or Central Asia or Canada, and we'll just never know. A second mystery, apart from patient zero, is the question of why this particular influenza outbreak was so severe. What made it both so extremely contagious and fast moving and so virulent and harmful in this specific time window of autumn 1918 and to this specific age group? It's extremely unusual and stands out from all other influenza epidemics. What made it different? Well, scientists have been able to find, as they've studied influenza and as they've particularly tried over the years to isolate and account for Spanish flu, they've found that the vast majority of strains of influenza seem to originate from birds, and particularly at root from wild water birds. For some reason, there's a sort of symbiosis between waterfowl and the influenza virus, and it's able to persist and develop and multiply, especially in the digestive tracts of water birds. So, you know, don't go around licking swan poop. So the theory arose pretty early on in the 1930s and 40s that Spanish flu must have begun somehow from birds and jumped to humans, particularly via pigs. There must have been some interaction where a virus had just the right qualities, just the right proteins to infect a pig and then from pigs to humans. So in hopes of testing this theory, scientists began looking for a surviving sample of the Spanish flu virus. No one had had Spanish flu for decades, but starting in the 19. 80s and 90s, scientists started to see if there was some way to locate it. And in 1996, scientists exhumed some human remains in a mass grave in Alaska. And you might remember there were Inuit and other indigenous communities in Alaska that were really severely devastated and had to bury many of their dead in mass graves in sort of tundra areas, basically permafrost. And this offered the hope that there might be human remains preserved with the virus still in them, frozen through the decades. And in 1996, a sample was found in uh, a lung of a woman who had died in Alaska. And they were able to sort of piece together the fragments of the virus, which had nonetheless broken down some over the years. And they pieced it back together like a jigsaw and found that the structure and makeup of the virus was very, very similar to bird flu strains, such that it almost surely originally came from birds. And it just happened that it had certain features that made it possible to also attack human cells. And when it did so, it was extremely alien to humans. It was a form of flu, dramatically different from anything that had infected humans before. And hence, the human immune system was very, very unprepared to deal with it. So it was, in this way, it was a deadly combination. It's extremely unusual and unfamiliar, but it is effective at invading human cells and replicating. This made it possible to then infect a human being and multiply very quickly before the immune system knew what to do with it. Furthermore, scientists were able to find more samples that they could date more precisely and hence know whether a person had been infected with this virus in the spring as opposed to the fall of 1918. And they made cross comparisons and they found that the virus had at some point a new form had appeared. Maybe it had mutated, maybe it just coincidentally happened to emerge from the bird or pig population around the same time. But for whatever reason, the form that broke out in the autumn of 1918 was a bit more adapted to humans and was able to multiply and attack the human body faster than the spring form. So this may account for the increase in virulence in the fall of 1918. So more or less the current theory of development is that 
there was a sort of ordinary seasonal flu season in the winter of 1917 to 18. But somewhere in that virus population that was circulating in 1917 to 18, there was also a new strain that had jumped from birds to humans, and that was significantly more virulent. And it spread more and more to the point that by March, it had reached a time where healthcare providers would have expected flu to be going away. And instead, they were seeing an increase. And that's where it, it's discernible that this more virulent bird origin flu was taking over and managing to hit people who otherwise would have been resistant to flu. However, that strain was still not so much more contagious among humans than other strains of flu. It was a bit more harmful. It made people sick. It, made, it forced people to go to the infirmary. It forced people to not go to work. But it didn't necessarily pass that much faster than other strains of flu. Then somehow during the summer of 1918, an adaptation or a mutation happened which made it even more contagious among humans and allowed it to multiply and replicate faster in human bodies. This kind of adaptation is really rare. Usually in a bad flu outbreak, it's bad, it runs its course, it dies out. It's not common for the virus to then somehow change in such a way that makes it more deadly. And part of why we rarely see that happen is because if a flu virus manages to break out and replicate itself, it's going to be most successful if it does not kill its hosts. If it infects people and those people remain reasonably healthy and remain alive, there's more chance that they're going to pass it on to more people. Flu strains that are particularly deadly are more likely to sort of stop in their tracks because healthy people will know to stay away. And once a person dies, they're usually buried or cremated, and they're no longer passing along the virus. So the question then is, well, why did this mutation happen that made the virus even more lethal? And why would that then be able to break out in a whole second wave? The current theory is that that mutation was able to occur because of the war because you had large concentrations of young men who were especially vulnerable to this particular form of flu, who were basically trapped in the trenches, in the army camps, in the naval bases, and also on ships at sea. And specifically, if you look at the young soldiers and officers who were on the war front, they were also being exposed to mustard gas and other poisonous gases. And mustard gas, it's a chemical weapon, and one of its features is it is mutogenic. It's toxic. It can cause mutations in DNA and RNA, which in humans can lead, for instance, to cancer. Well, in viruses, it can spur on rapid changes and mutations in the makeup of the virus. And so possibly the mustard gas might have spurred on the creation of many new strains and variations of this flu, one of which was more deadly, but was still able to break out and spread quickly, even though it was more deadly, because it was more contagious and it had this vulnerable sitting duck population among which it could break out quickly and gain a foothold in the human population and then break out around the rest of the world. So it was just this tragic, bizarre convergence of the wrong virus with the wrong war. Then there's finally the question of why it would particularly attack people in their 20s and 30s, even more so than the very young or the very old. One hypothesis that you might hear sometimes that might be a partial explanation is that the devastation of this virus probably didn't come from the virus itself, but more from the overactive immune response. It's the flood of, of fluids to the lungs and the high fever and other sort of extreme immune responses that actually killed people. And so hence, people in the prime of life who were very healthy would have particularly robust immune systems would be thrown into this kind of overactive response. 
Well, that explanation doesn't quite work for a number of reasons. One of them is that the strongest immune responses tend to come out in teenagers, people in their teens and early 20s. And those people were not hit as hard as people in their 20s and early 30s. 15-year-olds seem to have come out just fine, comparatively speaking. It was people who were in their in their 20s and early 30s. And it seems that some actuaries who did tabulations found that the average age of death for a Spanish flu victim was 33, which is just entirely bizarre and really does not fit any theory that was available at the time. So why would that be? Well, the further explanation that might account for this is that we now can see that people tend to respond the best and the most effectively to the first strain of flu that they're exposed to in their lives. So when you first get flu, you might be an infant, a child, a teenager, your immune system mounts a response and produces antibodies that will fight off that flu as best it can. And in most cases, you'll survive, especially if you're, you know, more than a few weeks old, you'll probably survive. And if you're ever exposed to that precise strain of flu again in your life, you'll be very prepared to fight it off. Whereas if you get a different strain of flu, your response will be weaker. Your immune system has already kind of been imprinted with that initial impact, and it's not going to fight as well against a different flu. So why is it then that people in that particular age cohort responded the worst to Spanish flu in 1918? Well, it might be because of the different forms of flu that people had been exposed to previously in previous pandemics. So there was one fairly large flu pandemic that broke out in much of Europe in the 1830s, starting in 1830. And so very old people, people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, had largely been exposed early in life to that flu pandemic. And maybe that flu was somewhat more similar to the Spanish flu. Maybe it had certain features in common. And hence, very old people actually died of Spanish flu at a lower rate than in other flu outbreaks. Spanish flu seems to have been slightly less lethal to elderly people than other flus. So maybe that's because of this connection or similarity to the 1830s flu. Then there had also been a very bad flu outbreak in the 1890s, which I mentioned before, which was called Russian flu. And so people in their 20s and 30s during the Spanish flu pandemic had largely been imprinted with some form of Russian flu. And it's possible, this is only speculation, but one possible explanation is that the Russian flu was very different from Spanish flu. And hence, people in that specific age cohort were unusually badly prepared to deal with Spanish flu. So those are our best theories and hypotheses that we can put forward today about why the Spanish flu unfolded in the way that it did. But apart from our scientific grasp of why it unfolded in this way, how have people dealt with it psychologically, ideologically? How is it remembered? Why does it seem in such a pervasive way to have been practically forgotten? Well, probably... The first reason we have to remember why it's been dropped out of public consciousness is that so many people really didn't grasp it or take note of it as an event at the time. People didn't necessarily understand that the flu they were suffering or that was breaking out in their town or their village was connected to this massive global event. And if we look at newspapers and magazines from the time of the outbreak and the few years after, from the end of the war into the early 1920s, there was fairly little note of the pandemic, other than occasional reports about the death tolls. There was not a lot of reporting or discussion. There was no reflection of any panic about it. Uh, One New York Times editor actually specifically wrote that one of the striking features of the flu was that it doesn't seem to have caused panic and alarm. 
And if we zero in on 1919 to 1921, as the flu was ending and then life was readjusting, there was far less mention in magazines and newspapers of the Spanish flu than there was of alcohol prohibition, the Russian Revolution, or even baseball, where you know there were events like the, the Black Sox baseball corruption scandal that seemed to have generated as much or maybe more comment in the press of the time. As Laura Spinney points out, if we look back from the perspective of the 21st century, back to those events of the First World War and the Spanish flu, since that time, there have been 80,000 books published about World War I and only 400 on the Spanish flu. So we're talking about a 200 factor of difference. Nonetheless, as Spinney says, this is still a significant increase from before. There has been an upsurge of interest and scholarship on the Spanish flu compared to during the 20th century. Really the first effort to make a comprehensive account and to really take stock of the scale of the disaster was the book The Forgotten Pandemic by Alfred Crosby, first published in 1976. And Crosby, as I mentioned before, he's the author of Ecological Imperialism, sort of the first person to try to put biology, health and disease into perspective in world history. Jared Diamond is kind of a low-rent Alfred Crosby knockoff. He was the first to even write a scholarly book taking stock of the Spanish flu. And that was more than 50 years after the event. And it was not followed up very much until really after 2000, when there's been a sort of small wave now of books culminating a few years ago with Laura Spinney's Pale Rider, which, you know, I think is probably the most fortuitously timed book in the, <laughs> in the history of publishing coming just in time for the current pandemic. When we look at major history books, accounts of American politics and life in the 20th century by prominent scholars like Richard Hofstadter or Arthur Schlesinger, most of them do not even mention the Spanish flu. Not a word. Only a couple even make a brief reference. And this can partly be put down to the evolution in the style of history. You know, 20th century history tends to be very political, very much about government and diplomacy. Spanish flu isn't really entirely necessary unless you look for it. You don't really have to refer to Spanish flu as part of the politics and war of the early 20th century. And it's only more lately that scholars have tried to feed an interest in social history, in the history of everyday life and private experience, in which the Spanish flu is then an absolutely necessary part of the story. If we look at literature, if we put scholarship aside and say, well, maybe literature gives us more of people's feelings, private reflections, the texture of life, especially modern literature, well, it's incredible to see the contrast between the attention paid to World War I and the Spanish flu. You know, World War I is a sort of looming, powerful, emotional touchstone in modern literature, arguably even more than the Second World War, whereas Spanish flu hardly shows up. And when we talk about the First World War, we can think of enormous, iconic, you know, myth-making works like All Quiet on the Western Front, or smaller closet dramas like Return of the Soldier, about people dealing with the emotional, personal impact of the war. We can think of films like Gallipoli or almost a kind of spate of recent movies about World War I, like War Horse and 1917. There is nothing comparable in fiction or film for Spanish flu. There are some impactful works of literature that have commanded some attention that at least partly refer to the Spanish flu, at least acknowledge that it happened. Probably the biggest example is Thomas Wolfe's novel, Look Homeward, Angel. It's a largely autobiographical novel about growing up in North Carolina. And there is the passage where the main character is summoned home from college to his family home in 
a thinly veiled Hendersonville, North Carolina, where he then is just in time to witness the death of his brother from pneumonia. And the novel doesn't even use the phrase Spanish flu, but it can be inferred to people who lived through those events that that is what happened to this brother who tragically died so young. One other example is the short story, not even a novel, but the short story Pale Horse, Pale Rider by the author Catherine Ann Porter, where she discusses her own bout with Spanish flu, as well as the death of the army lieutenant with whom she was in love, who did not survive the flu. And you can get some insight from Pale Horse, Pale Rider into why this enormous cataclysmic event was so little remarked and even recalled. She describes the incredible sort of frenzied preoccupation with the war, the obsessive repeating of war slogans, the fundraising, give till it hurts, the constant reference to our noble boys over there. Everything seemed to hang on and revolve around the minute events and developments of the war, culminating eventually with the armistice. And from that perspective, it can, it can make some sense that talking about the flu outbreak could actually seem selfish. It could seem like you were shirking your responsibility to be concerned about the war and to support the war effort if you fretted over or complained over your own illness or that of your friends and neighbors. And that is probably part of why it was kind of swept under the rug, both at the time and afterwards. And there's a little scene in Pale Horse, Pale Rider where she describes being in one of these massive, you know, gymnasium hospitals in rows of beds, trying to fight through this horrible flu, and then hearing a sort of shaky, scratchy, rendition of my country tis of thee rising up from these sick patients when they hear the news of the armistice in November 1918. So even while people are, you know, struggling to live, they're still putting their attention and their emotional energy into the war. Now, I would say from my point of view, as a person living in the 21st century, that these two works, Look Homeward Angel and Pale Horse, Pale Rider, are not that much read and known today. You know, experts of literature might know them, and maybe they are still taught in some literature classes, but I was certainly never assigned them, and I've never really even seen them named as among the canon of essential American literature. And if they are read today, there's probably going to be an uptick (laughs) in attention to them because they are such rare instances of the Spanish flu even showing up in literature. And in terms of popular culture, entertainment, film, television, it's so rare. And probably you know where this is going. (laughs) Its biggest claim to fame, at least in the English-speaking world today, is probably as the cause of death that conveniently knocked off the troublesome rival love interest to Lady Mary Crawley in Downton Abbey. Lady Grantham, Cora, was a survivor of the Spanish flu, and she is depicted with the, the profuse nosebleeds, and something of the severity of the illness maybe is conveyed in that television show. But, you know, it's all within an episode, and then everything moves on, right? Do people in the later episodes of Downton Abbey even refer back to the horror or trauma of that disease? Not that I can recall. Why has it been so forgotten? Why was it overlooked and forgotten despite its scale? There are these reasons that I've pointed to, but there are also some things that probably apply more broadly to plagues and pandemics in general. They're a lot harder to record. They come up unexpectedly. They attack people in unpredictable ways. Many of the people who could be writing about them and commenting on them are too busy either treating patients or getting sick themselves. There's no big dramatic spectacle like a battle, you know, no moving armies. It happens mostly in private. When we read about the Spanish flu today, we might see many pictures of large hospitals with rows of beds. But most people were sick at home or or being cared for in their schools, their orphanages. It's not as public an event, 
And public gatherings usually have to be suppressed anyway. So it's very rare to see, to, to ever be able to literally view what's happening around you. Plagues don't have the same drama as wars. They don't have winners. They just eventually go away. And there isn't the same sort of glory of facing off against a formidable enemy and winning. Not much is gained. In a war, someone can say, I'm the victor and I gained this territory or I gained reparations, something. With a plague, usually there's just loss and then it ends. There's nothing to celebrate. There's also a matter of whom plagues and pandemics hit. They hit usually the poor and poor crowded places the most severely. And even in wealthy places, they tend to hit the servants. And those are the people who are less valued, less respected, who most often in most of the world are illiterate, can't write about their experiences even if they wanted to. And so they're less remarked because of who's bearing the brunt. And there's also the factor of shame and embarrassment. Today, people might proudly say, I'm a breast cancer survivor. There was no pride in surviving diseases <laughs> in 1918. Disease was seen as something often shameful, unseemly to be dealt with and then dispensed with. And as I said, most action by the medical profession was futile. There was a lot of shame and embarrassment, not a lot of desire to speak about a disaster that doctors and nurses had failed to prevent. Also governments, a lot of governments didn't do well in dealing with the pandemic. Some did better than others, but it wasn't something that necessarily the mayor of Philadelphia would want to brag about when it had simply rolled through the city without much effective response. So it's not something people would necessarily want to talk about. At the time, as for why people didn't notice it and didn't or, well, didn't take note of it as a major event the way they did the war. Another reason is that at that time, pandemics were not such a new and strange thing. A lot of us today might be sort of reeling and confused and trying to look for a historical precedent for the present disease. But in 1918, people had known there were previous flu outbreaks, as well as there were, in living memory, there were terrible outbreaks of cholera and typhus and other epidemic diseases. So it wasn't seen as necessarily something remarkable and world historical. And it was at the home front at a time, as I said before, when attention was focused obsessively on the war and our boys and the sacrifice that people were making in the war. Other factors that were sp specific to Spanish flu that might be part of why it was not remembered. The way that this disease worked and the sort of damage that it did, it could leave lasting health damage for some people. Like I said, like sinus infections and ear infections and mood effects. But it did not leave visible marks and scars like other pandemic diseases. It did not leave behind pock marks like smallpox that would carry through the life of people like George Washington. It did not leave paralysis like polio. So there were, it, it left open that possibility of simply not talking about it and forgetting about it because it didn't leave those physical scars. There's also the fact, as Alfred Crosby points out, it attacked younger people. And in general, people in their 20s and 30s have not built up power, wealth, and fame the way older generations might have done. And so hence, the people who were struck down were not very famous leaders of society who would then inspire mass mourning or mass rituals. The presidents and prime ministers who got it almost all survived. David Lloyd George, Woodrow Wilson, they survived and recovered. And in many cases, there were prominent senators and generals and politicians who either never got the disease or survived it, but their children were lost. So there was this personal psychological devastation from the loss of these young people even though the older, more prominent, more powerful men were not struck down. 
And an interesting example that Crosby points to is Samuel Gompers. His daughter Sadie died while he was away in Italy, and he was devastated and, according to some people, never recovered. But physically, he was fine and healthy, and life went on. So there was no huge changeover of power. There were no major leaders who were lost. There was no political upheaval because kings or emperors or presidents were struck down. And there was no big public mourning ritual like you would get in a funeral for someone like George Washington when he died of epiglottitis in 1799. So the devastation in this way remained private and arguably unresolved. And so now it can seem so strange to us that Spanish flu is so little discussed and so little marked in our history, but it's taken this time of decades and generations to appreciate the sort of event that it was. And as I said before, there's a turn now more and more towards social history, towards the history of private and emotional lives, the history of people's psyches, the, the everyday, instead of just the political narratives that are, that are the traditional stuff of history. And then there's also a turn, I think, of interest towards Spanish flu because of the different conditions we live in now. There's a shift in how we understand disease. You know, disease is no longer a subject of shame and embarrassment the way it was for centuries. It also is not something that kills as many people as rapidly as it used to. You know, over m much of the world, rates of mortality have gone down, particularly from infectious disease. It's more normal to live into old age uh, rather than die in your 20s and 30s. And more often, people have chronic conditions uh, or cancer or organ failure that lead to, to death in old age. And so the notion of someone dying of an infection like influenza is more bizarre and shocking to us now than it was then. And the, the idea of a deadly epidemic is more strange and exotic, in some ways you could say even romantic to us now than it used to be. There have been different points in time when people attached a sort of romance to consumption, to, to seeing young bohemians dying of tuberculosis, like in La Boheme. And maybe there's a little shade of that in Downton Abbey and its depiction of tragically dying of Spanish flu to conveniently make way for, <laughs> for, for Mary and Matthew to get back together. But suddenly, Spanish flu seems so important and so timely now that it's really the nearest instance we can reach back to where people dealt with an even greater pandemic than what we are experiencing now. So thank you so much for listening to this discussion of Spanish flu. I know it was a long wait, and I hope that it's illuminating. And again, I'll put in the description a link to Lyceum, to this, this new platform where patrons who contribute should be able to get access to one continuous feed of all the public and private patron-only material. And if you're not already a patron and supporter, I encourage you to go to my Patreon, also under Historian Explaining. Thank you.